Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett have been researching ancient British history since 1976 and have so far published nine books. They seek out the oldest sources and go where the evidence takes them. Ancient manuscripts, stone carvings, paintings, church records, maps, place names, ancient poems and archaeological finds are their bread and butter. Their conclusions and discoveries from over 30 years of detailed research have not been well received in some quarters. Their discoveries include the burial sites of King Arthur I and King Arthur II, a dynasty of 80 British kings, not to mention the alleged resting place of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Cross. In this series of programmes I will be presenting Wilson and Blackett's evidence for these potentially earth-changing discoveries. This evidence is in later programmes. I will also be describing the struggle they have endured over the last 30 years, including multiple murder attempts and media smear campaigns. I will be exposing the deep-rooted corruption in academia and publicly funded bodies which Wilson and Blackett have meticulously documented over the years. It's not easy to pinpoint exactly who is behind the attempts to discredit them. Suggestions range from corporate and political interests, British intelligence, the Catholic Church and possibly Freemasonic interests. As I will show in the upcoming series of programmes, there is no doubt that there is a conspiracy to derail these forensic historians' efforts to uncover the truth. What's the reason why this research is so dangerous and being obfuscated by certain parties? Mm -hmm. uh, religion comes into it, obviously, unfortunately. We try to dodge it for years, but you can't. Right. Um, Christianity arrived in Britain in 35 AD. Mm -hmm. Uh, the crucifixion apparently took place in 33 AD. Mm -hmm. uh, this is well attested. Mm -hmm. uh, Nennius records it. He died, he's a great historian, in 822. Uh, Gildas says it, and he died in, uh, in the 6th century. Uh, the Cardinal Baronius was the great Catholic Church historian of the early 16th century, and Cardinal Alford, the real name is Griffiths, they both said it, and it's accepted by the Catholic Church. And, but they don't say it very often, they don't say it very loudly. But Christianity began in Britain. Holy Family arrived in Western Britain. Mm -hmm. These are the subject of Poussin so, paintings that are such right. a mystery. Basically, my collaboration began in 1976, when I was very young. Alan's been with our family since I was in, in infancy. And it's only from 76, the research developed and mushroomed. King Craddock and his family went to Rome in 51 AD. Mm -hmm. uh, his sister Claudia married the Aulus, the, the hugely important Roman, mm -hmm. and she was put on trial for being a heretic because she's a Christian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she wouldn't believe in Jupiter and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, Rufus, uh, who was the son of this guy, he marries Urgine, the daughter of King Craddock. And uh, again, you've got problems with heresies and that, and the, the house of Rufus became the first Christian church in Rome. Mm -hmm. um, he appears in the Bible, they had four daughters, all of whom were martyred later, and uh, you have a fairly solid foundation for Christianity, starting in Britain, being taken to Rome. Having said that, I've, I've become almost, in, the, in more recent years, the role of a minder as much as a collaborator. Well, obviously, your research uh, has pr proved that there were two King Arthurs and that yes. there were a, a, a dynasty yeah. of 80 Welsh kings. Yes. Now, now tell... Brit no, no, British kings. Sorry, British kings. Yeah. yeah. There weren't uh, any Wales. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, now, that also is upsetting possibly to the monarchy, th that research. Uh, yes, it, it could be. Uh, just um, explain why. Well, Yesenab oh. Gurgen dies, or oh, was deposed in 1091. Mm -hmm. uh, he allegedly had 14 sons mm -hmm. and several daughters. Uh, the Welsh gentry, then sons of the lesser ones, all, as in England, kept their pedigrees and their genealogies. And I don't think the British public is generally aware of the huge mass of manuscript evidence that's available in this thing. So uh, there are many people around today who can, and some of them do, claim their descent from Justin, Yestin. Mm -hmm. Actually, the last king was a descendant of his. Morgan was killed in 1300 which, AD. Which goes back to Arthur II. And they all go back to Arthur II, who right. just dies in uh, 579. Right. Arthur II is the son of King Moirig or Morris. He is a sixth generation de direct descendant of Arthur I. Mm -hmm. 
who is Arthur who invaded Europe. Mm -hmm. His father is he's a son of Magnus Maximus by Magnus's first wife, Kindrek, mm -hmm. not his second wife. And, mm -hmm. and he is the only son of Crispus Nobilis Flavius Caesar. So, uh, well, uh, Crispus is the eldest son of Constantine the Great. Mm -hmm. He married, he's the son of Helen, mm -hmm. big British princess, and the emperor, Constantine Florus. Helen is directly sent to the Holy Family. Right. So it starts to wobble about all over the place. Now, obviously, the Queen of England, having two parents, four grandparents, and then eight, sixteen, yeah. has got about uh, a putative half a million descendants, uh, yeah. uh, ancestors, sorry. So it's quite possible she could trace back into these lines anyway. But obviously, it's, uh, she's not, in the sense of Britishness, she's not a senior person. So it undermines. It could who undermine. Is the, the actual, it could undermine her, yeah. Uh, yeah. True monarch. In the sense of descent from Brutus and the British kings, yes. Right. That's another reason why it's, it's, it's mm. possibly wanting to be covered up. So you've got the religious angle, you've got the, the monarchist angle. Uh, yeah. Political influences and sheer greed are other possible reasons why this research is not popular, which Alan explains later. These new discoveries mean that academia should re-examine some of its accepted theories, but the system of academia is often not flexible. Uh, they are people who have been trained in a system of rote. You follow my leader, and everybody keeps it. It's like an army. Uh, <laughs> an army has a general, some commanding officers, colonels, and all the rest march in step. Mm -hmm. Well, academia is like that. Mm -hmm. There's always one or two leading great figures, the big guys, the professor this of Oxford or somewhere, mm -hmm. and lesser professors, and the rest of the herd. Mm -hmm. they, I don't mean that rudely to them, mm -hmm. but the, the, the behavior is such that they all have to keep in step. Yeah. And the junior uh, person who becomes a member of academic staff, he's a junior lecturer, he's not going to quarrel with the professor, he's going to keep in line. Because yeah. he wants to A, keep his job, and B, get promotion. Now, so lecturer, senior lecturer, assistant professor, Professor, head of uh, mm. the chair, of pro the, it's a promotion line. The only way you get there is by keeping in step. Mm. Now, you've published nine books, Alan, yeah. on this work, many of them about King Arthur. Yeah. Um, one of them is about your assertion that the, uh, of, of where the Ark of the Covenant, probably the most important Aye. archaeological ar artifact in, in mm. history, uh, you believe is... is in a particular hill, hillside in Wales called Unis Abol. It's in Britain. Uh, yeah. You've published that in a book called Discovery of the Ark. Mm. And n now you've suspected that that was there since when, the, the sort of mid 80s? Uh, I got a photograph from my colleague there right. in 82. Right. Uh, so now, but you didn't, you've not actually published this in a book until what year? The sort of. No, uh, a couple of years ago. 2005. Right. Six. I'm at a village called Unis Abul in South Wales, and behind me is a hill, on top of which is a, a man made mound. The hill is, uh, I'm not sure if this is the correct pronunciation, Twin E Glog. And according to Alan Wilson, um, the Ark of the Covenant is buried inside the man made part. Of this hill behind me. So this is another reason potentially why your work is perhaps or y y there's been smear campaigns against you because mm. they want you and Barham out of the picture possibly yeah. because they don't want you to be the ones that are going to find this extremely important artifact. In a later show Alan will present his evidence as to why the Ark of the Covenant is in this seemingly unlikely place. I can assure you this show is not to be missed. What I'm going to do now is, uh, Alan has had um, metal detection done on this hill in the past and he claims that there is an object which is four feet by two feet, non-ferrous metal, so many feet below the surface. And he has in the past tried to get this hill dug up. Um, he's approached the Welsh authorities, he's approached the farmers. The farmers have been talked out of um, having any excavation done. So I'm intrigued to speak to the, to the owners of the land, um, a farm just a few minutes down the road here so I'm going to knock on the door and firstly ask them if they've considered you know um, getting this land to go because of the Ark of the Covenant there is there you're talking and <laughs> the most important um, the most important object in archaeological history if you like um, is inside this hill in Wales if Alan Wilson is correct so I'm going to go and speak to them I'm first going to ask them if 
I can have access to their land just so that I can film on top of the hill uh, and film the um, the sumps which are along the side of the hill which allegedly keep the whole chamber dry and once we've done that I'm then going to go and ask um, if he'll give us permission to actually get other people involved and get his land dug up to see if there's anything there. It seems the most damaging attempt to derail Wilson and Blackett's work may have occurred in August 2011, which is one of the reasons why I was compelled to make this series of programmes. Their house is in private grounds and is patrolled 24 hours a day by two guard dogs. The reason we had dogs is the cemetery behind, and for several years uh, the gates were always left open. There's some sets of very tall tombstones around the back, and people had put canvases over them, and one guy actually had a bed and a three-piece suite in uh, on the grave. Right. <laughs> His canvas. He was living there, and uh, the drug addicts were there in a big way, right. cocaine and that sort of thing. And down by there were the lesser sort of drugs, you know, whatever they do. But we had to have dogs, because there's a small laneway about two feet wide between us and the block of flats they built there, far too close to our house, right? Mm -hmm. And all the youths and kids of creation were running around in the lanes and banging on windows there. The dogs were an end to all that. Right. What probably. happened next is 2008, some new guy moved in the bottom flat down there. It turns out he's a Londoner. Next thing you know, another Londoner moves in, right? Probably. I go to the shop one day, get the front gate. I'm in my 70s, let's face it. I got a shopping bag in my hand. And number two, this Swiss fellow's out, so outside, and he says, I want a word with you. He's only been living here about six weeks, right? Mm -hmm. I said, all right. He said, you're upsetting the ladies in these flats. Huh? You know, I had very good relationships with him before. Yeah. I said, oh. He said, yeah. He said, oh, you're coming out, are you? He said, I'll fight. And he's doing this, waving his fists about, you know, fight me, you know. Yeah. I said, oh, get lost. I said, F off, you know. Uh -huh. And I went over to the shop, you know. Uh, and that was the first sign of trouble. What actually happened was all was perfectly tranquil and peaceful in the vicarage and the surrounding areas until late 2008. I've discovered that there was a man next door. Right, trouble so this and is, trouble. So this is a house which overlooks your grounds. It's right it's a, next flat, door. a flat which overlooks the grounds of, of this house. Yes. And you and Alan, you suspect that he's been put there deliberately to intimidate or to um, you know cause problems for you he has been filled full of disinformation wound up like a clockwork rat and sent specifically from london to cause disruption right. so you've got yeah is, and he is from london he's, he's not from london from up here got no reason to come here the next thing we know the dogs are starting in the house at eight or nine they're starting whining or barking and getting excited and I said, someone's blowing a whistle or something, because they're, you know, they're up. Uh -huh. There's something going on here. And the dogs would want to be out. Well, they're they out during the late, the early evening, they put it out in the afternoons. Next thing we know, they're barking like lunatics, you know. Mm -hmm. We got the back, nothing there. This went on. And we're sitting in the other room one night, and I, what, and I could see some sort of a flash of light outside. Mm -hmm. The dogs were... Um, incited with an, literally a strobe lamp by, instigated by mm -hmm. and they were, that including whistles to excite the dogs and got Alan Wilson into trouble. Um, so there were, you, you think he was deliberately upsetting the dogs to get them to bark so that he could then complain to the council about the noise? Exactly. Next night it's flashing like the can of hay or something wrong. So we went out and there's a guy standing in the lane with a strobe lamp flashing lights. Right. And they've got another one, they must have had a whistle or something, dog whistle, exciting the dogs were going mad. Right. They were driving the dogs, but bananas. Upstairs flat, flat, they were throwing food down yeah. for the dogs. So they then complained about the noise of the dogs. Right. For the last two years, Wilson and Blackett had been keeping a lodger in their home. You were employing a young lad, or a, yeah. a man in his 20s, mm. to be a... A driver and a gardener or... Yeah, yeah, Andy man, because I'm Andy getting man. old, I'm 79, I thought yeah. we'd get someone to and drive. And uh, we need the garden doing them and other things. House. He's been living f free in lieu of being a minder and a gardener 
for uh, over two and a half years. Right. So he'd been staying here for two and a half years. Yeah, for, uh, yes. And, and he's, he's a youngish man. He's, he's a young man in his early 20s. Right. In August 2011, just after 3 a.m., Wilson and Blackett were asleep when a sudden violent fire broke out in Baron Blackett's bedroom. There was a fire. Fire alarm. You were in bed. It was a Sunday morning. Or, uh, 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 about 3.15. Combustion, sorry, suddenly exploded, which immediately was followed by a fast <coughs> and furious <coughs> inferno, a fast and furious inferno fire. Mm -hmm. And I know it's for sure it's an incendiary device because I've seen an incendiary device in operation. I've heard an incendiary device, and the noise of the incendiary device is what woke Alan Wilson up in the bedroom, right. in the other bedroom. I woke up, you know, so something must have awakened me. Mm -hmm. When you wake up, like suddenly something has awakened you, probably a noise. You know. um, and uh, I, I was so awake, I got to put the bedside lamp on, got out of bed, and I put the light in the room on, and the ceiling light. And then I noticed a, a little wisp of smoke in the bottom of my door. That couldn't have wakened me, but you know, but there was a wisp of smoke coming into the door. I opened the door, the, the landing outside is filling up with smoke, and it's coming out of, it seems to be coming from my colleague's bedroom. Right. Uh, all sorts of poisonous toxins, including carbon monoxide, certain monoxides, they give me a long plethora of all the poisons in the hospital. Yeah. So I went to his bedroom, doors half open, pushed it open, got in, and I'm searching in the dark, and I found him. Dragged him out on the landing, you see. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on. Because smoke apparently disorientates people. Mm -hmm. they, they can get disoriented very quickly, apparently. Yeah. Anyway, got to the top of the stairs. I ran down the stairs, phone 999. Alan um, was excellent. He phoned the fire brigade. He kept us calm. And he phoned the fire brigade and the police. Um, the, the fire brigade came very quickly, within minutes. We got a fire in the house. I want a fire brigade. Get, get address. I gave him the address, you know, Vicarage Court, Benwell Lane, Newcastle, mm -hmm. code. Repeat that, I repeated it, we're on our way. Well, we're lucky actually, because straight down the road here, this is a main road outside, mm -hmm. but straight down this main road, just over a mile, is the fire station. Mm -hmm. And at 70 mile an hour, yeah. they're going to get here in under yeah. a minute. Straight along Elswick Road, yeah. Straight along, bang, Elswick Road, Adelaide Terrace in the year, bang. Yeah. And, uh, so I went back, he's at the top of the stairs. I said, come on, get down. I said, yeah, took him down. Then I realised I got to open the front gate, let the fire begin. I look out, they're there already. And there was a police helicopter above the house. Mm -hmm. And um, I was taken to the hospital after, like some jungle animal, I, I cut several onions to induce vomiting. Unbelievable, they must have gone 80 miles an hour. Yeah. So I, I go out and I realised I got nothing on my feet and I gravel. Oh. Outside, you know, it's like walking on nails. Right. I get to the gate and I haven't got the key to unlock it. I say, I haven't got a key. They handed me a bolt shears, so bang, cut the lock off. Two big elephant like men charged past me. Anybody in there? I said, Yeah, he'd be by the stairs. Uh -huh. so I, I said, One person. So they charged past me. Another person charged up to him with a, uh, a hose. And the next thing I know, there's a guy who's got hold of me and he's literally thrown me into an ambulance. I did vomit. I vomit outside the ambulance before so you, I actually got to the hospital. Right, so now, you vomited outside the ambulance. Within seconds, they had him out, Tony, put him in the other ambulance and went away. But there were four or five appliances, two police cars, and then a helicopter. Can you remember going into the hospital? Very vaguely. If I let the um, raw onions be uh, absorbed into the system, they could do more harm than good. If, it's vom if it induces vomit immediately, then it can do good. Right. But it's not just the um, stomach, it's also the uh, respiratory tract. Mm -hmm. which we, we, I, I was like the girl in the exorcist, spewing a black tar, almost. Right. Black, black muck. My tongue was all black. My face was black. So did you, did you communicate with him at all at the hospital? Did a little, yeah, I could. Uh, right. there then, but then he was clearly going. He was starting to go. He, he was, was starting, starting to go. go. Uh, you know. So, so you can't remember being in the hospital then? I can remember very, very vaguely, but it, it's very vague. Right, so it must be around about that time that you've passed out then? It, was, it must have been about that, around that time, yes. Right. And they kept him in, put him in uh, intensive care straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, they kept me in and let me go the next afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, and said, you know, we have to be in intensive care in a bad way. Mm -hmm. I went... I told his parents, I told his uncle and aunts, I told his sister, I told everybody I could, right, you know, mm -hmm. all those who need to know, a few friends. Mm -hmm. 
And then I went in the day after myself, and they wouldn't let me in. And I said, look, we've been working together for 30 years. I know him better than maybe on the planet. It's up to you. Like His parents then said, you've got to let him in. He's the person he'll probably know best on the planet. Right? You know? mm -hmm. So they said, well, you can go in, but do us a favor, talk to him. Because even though he's in an induced coma, which he's in, he may be able to hear your voice. He said, it helps. We think this is a theory. Like, How long were you in a coma for? Nearly two weeks. So you were completely unconscious for two weeks? Totally unconscious, but I had uh, positive abstracts, wheels spinning around my head. I wouldn't allow any negativity to um, get me down. Now, my attitude was thrive under pressure. Don't let the bastards succeed. So I, I went in for a couple of hours of talking away, you know, telling them everything's okay, it's all going to be all right, which it wasn't. They'd sent me home on my own to this place. And I walked in, the whole of the upstairs, all the walls, ceilings, everything were black. Uh, it was incredible. Mm. All the curtains were black, the bedding was, everything was black. Mm. I, I didn't see anything like it. And his room was wrecked, mm. totally burned out. Windows had been smashed in the passageway in all the bedrooms to let the smoke out. They do that. So I got smashed. <laughs> oh, Christ, you wouldn't believe it. Consensus of opinion amongst the doctors, and one of them was a professor, actually, was that my chances of survival were going back 20 years of experience, of their experience in the RVI and the Freeman's Hospital, were 25%. I think he's going to die. So you witnessed this? They young... said to me then, I said, I want to know what the form is. They said, well, we can't do and they're humming, and they all look glum. I said, look, I need to know, so that I need to know. I said, you can tell me, I'm a big lad. They said, well, he's got 25% chance of survival. 25%? Mm. And how they long said, was, he, was he in the coma for? And, uh, nearly 11 days. 11 days, and, and were you there when he came around? And they said, the other thing is, if he comes out of it, he lives, he could have brain damage. 25% chance, and that's been to expect the worst to set to be family and Alan Wilson and others. Do you remember coming round after two weeks? I can't remember, but I was told by my family, which I have no reason to disbelieve it at all, I think. On, the, on Sunday afternoon, the, th the 14th of August, they, they brought a, there was a Catholic priest with the family, mm -hmm. and he gave me a, a blessing, mm -hmm. a blessing with this oil and cloth. Mm -hmm probably on the foyer, but obviously I was totally oblivious of that being in the coma. Uh -huh. And he just touched me hold, struck me forehead and said, he will be all right. Right. Now I'm not particularly religious, but I'm not an atheist either. So um, some of my family believe that um, the Catholic priest was actually one of the contributory factors to my remarkable recovery. Were you there when he came around or? Did the, no, did he... no, I wasn't there, but I went in shortly afterwards. And he was just over there. He, he was trying to speak. He couldn't speak properly. <laughs> like a drug. He was weird. But we were just glad he was around, like, you know. Right. Now, he had needles all over him and stuff in his throat and his mouth. And his, right. And he was like a spaceship. Do you have any, I mean, recollection of when you were in a, I know it's a crazy question. Uh, thrive under pressure. <clears throat> Don't let the bastards get you down. Um, this is, you can do this, you can get through this. I was at a seaside resort. Right, so it's like a survival instinct kicked in. You yeah, think. but first of all, people have said it's a fire by smoking. The fire brigade have dispelled that, and it's a mystery to the fire brigade, the North America fire brigade, mm -hmm. right? It's definitely not smoking. It goes against the laws of physics and science that it could be started by an electrical fault because the electrics are all intact, including the insulation. So the electrics were checked after the, the fire? The, the lights were still on when the fire started. Mm -hmm. There's no cooking taking place. Once the dust had settled, Alan realised what happened did not seem right. It didn't make the, the, sense. The, the, Put the, it this way, it didn't make sense to me. None of it made sense because at 3.15 in the morning, you're both fast asleep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it didn't make sense. And it was, it was a, what the hell is happening here? It was, what the hell is going on? He doesn't smoke. He will have a cigar at Christmas or something. He likes the smell of it. Mm. Uh, he doesn't smoke. He certainly doesn't smoke in bed. Mm. And it, neither of us have been out drinking. Mm. So we'd had a night there watching the boxing on TV Saturday night and that. And we got to bed fairly late, I suppose. And now Alan used to work for the National Lossages, that's called Ellison Buckle. Alan Wilson, I'm referring to. And he used to, it was his job to inspect fires and assess the damage and the compensation appropriate. And he has never seen anything like it before. There's no 
conceivable way that that is a natural fire. Alan Wilson wrote to the police on the 18th of September 2011 explaining all the facts about the incident, but the police have so far not even entered the house to investigate. And there is a, a, a damaged floorboard, well it's one of the um, rafters underneath the floorboards which appears to have like a, a chunk missing from it. So it, it clearly looks as though something has either exploded or um, you know, there's, there's an impact where that, where that beam has been damaged. It's not, it's not just fire damage. You can see that it's, it, that it's possibly something. It is something. combustion, a bomb. Combustion means it, when you kickstart a motorbike mm. or start up an engine, combustion. It started with the explosion, and then it was followed by the um, fast and furious inferno, the fire. And that's exactly what an incendiary okay. device does. I've seen an incendiary yeah. device in the 1990s by an MI5 operative. Who actually rented accommodation from us and an office. Yeah. So this an incendiary device will extremely quickly turn a room into, as you describe it, an inferno. An that's inferno, what, that's, that's what, is what happened. And he's the head of the Northumbria, one of the heads of the main fire investigation department. He said it wasn't smoking, we've got no answer to that. He says, our job is to stop fires and save lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a pr prerogative of the police if it's been suspected foul play. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of it. We've had, we have had electricians here, we've had architects here, we have had engineers here, and they all say the same thing. I mean, this is serious stuff, Barham. This is an attempted murder, if you're right. It's attempted arson, murder, and conspiracy to murder. Right. That now, is the foulest crime that can, can be done. I mean, can you imagine anything worse than a bomb or a fire being burnt alive in your own bed? Right. So that was what I was talking about before, where the... Um, the supports underneath the floorboards there. If, where, I just, if I just come down, like you can see there. This is where the incendiary device was placed. You see this coming down here? Yeah. You can see the combustion. Yeah. So that there's part of that floorboard. What I've kept is I've kept the two key floorboards. Yeah. I'll get them out now. Which were originally here. Yeah. Like so that. that floorboard was there. This is there. Uh, this heinous atrocity was very calculated and insidiously planned. So could this really be an attempt on Baron Blackett's life? What uh, uh, evidence do you have that it is actually a, a conspiracy, not just a natural fire? Well, first of all, it must be emphasised that on national television, I think it was um, 27th of November this year, mm -hmm. If a calamity, a fire, as such, happens on a Saturday night or early Sunday morning, this, there is a 20% chance, mm -hmm. more chance of a fatality yeah. than any other time of the week. Maybe it's because the staff are preoccupied or they can't get people to do them shifts. Mm -hmm. People are reluctant to do them shifts. or the, Maybe the, it's because they're busy. Probably a combination of what both. Mm -hmm. Now, the second point is... There was a warmest night in August, just about that Saturday night. We were supposed to go out. So it's another factor. They don't pick a, a damp, rainy night when they can get a nice hot summer night. Mm -hmm. We were expected to go out. Um, I've, I've already mentioned that John McNeil, for the first time since he moved here, stayed, was aware that Saturday he disappeared. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's also a medical fact that people are at their deepest, darkest sleep between approximately 3.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. John McNeil was the only other person that had access to the house. Remember the house is guarded by dogs, has high walls, and on that night McNeil stayed out of the house. Baron Blackett also recalls a conversation with McNeil a few days before the fire, where McNeil specifically asked him if he is going out for a drink on the night of the fire. Now, when someone, he asked me, Are you, well, get yourself out, cajoling me to get out in New, Newcastle, like, typically Newcastle, sort of uh, way. And, and, and I thought, why is he asking me that? But I said, yes, we're going out Saturday night. But he okay. knew that we were going to expect it to go out. We were penciling to go out that Saturday night. And we, would have, we would have probably got back uh, approximately 1.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Now, we did not go out. And I had this feeling of unease that something wasn't quite right. Okay. I don't know if you've had this foreboding instinct right. yourself, but something wasn't quite right. 
Now I smelt a rat because I got some um, a, a subtle and not particularly subtle indications. Little signals such as a, a, a glint, a wrong glint in McNeil's eye, for example. Mm -hmm. The wrong question here. Above all, that Saturday night he was out of the house. Now all the other previous Saturday nights, without exception, he's always remained in the house. He never went out because he wants to get up early and sprightly, be, be sprightly for football training on mm -hmm. Sunday, early Sunday morning, I mean jogging and training in general. Mm -hmm. Now, why did he go out on Saturday night of the 13th of August? Right. So these combined, combined factors all put together mm -hmm. made me suspicious. And I had this feeling of an ease, and by 8.30, I cancelled the taxi. Mm -hmm. Everything was cancelled. We never touched a drop of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Shortly after Barham was discharged from hospital, his brother came to visit him at the house and was also visited by John McNeil, who disclosed some information. What actually happened was I was discharged on around lunchtime on the 7th of September. We came back, my brother had come back the previous night from London, my, uh, my brother, and um, see me, obviously see how I was. The house was in, it was in absolute chaos. Obviously a bomb had literally hit it. It's not a metaphor. Yeah, the damage. bed, as you, you've seen yourself, yeah, the bed I've was seen literally, the, the only thing remains of the bed were yeah. the metal steel springs. Yes, I've Everything seen that. was totally annihilated. Yeah. And McNeil didn't come to work because he was all uh, very clean and, and well dressed. He had had a drink and smelled like alcohol on his breath. And he, he basically came, I think, to see the, um, the, the, the fancy work, what happened with, out of the fancy work. And um, um, he mentioned something about, he did mention specifically about, a, it, was just, it was only a recording device I put under your bed. It was only a recording device. He was told it was a recording device. So, hang on, he said to you, it was only a recording device. I yeah, so he's actually words, disclosed to you and Alan that he's put something under your bed yes, the night before uh, this in, yes, supposed fire. In inference, he's right. basically saying in a way, he might not have said it had he not been drinking or whatever, he is saying in front of myself and two independent witnesses that it's got nothing to do with the recording device, this fire. Right, it's got nothing to do with No, the but he didn't actually say device. that. He said it was only a, rec only a recording device. Right. This is a signed statement from Baron Blackett's brother stating that John McNeil said, I was persuaded to put a listening device under Tony's bed. Tony is Baron Blackett's other name. Yeah, if it was a listening device, there's not really much point in putting a listening device under somebody's bed because you go to bed to go to sleep. You're probably more likely to put it in the living room or some room where conversation happens. So do you think then, and you know, we're, we're leading by assumption here, do you think then he's been told or asked to put a device which he thought was a recording device under your bed, but it was actually something else? Is that yes. Well, he's the only person who had access, and he seemed to act very strangely. He was, he was in a state of shock, in my opinion. And um, he disappeared again, and I've never spoken to him since. The point is, I'm talking from inquiries. I've got no concrete evidence. Mm -hmm. Who else could have put the incendiary device on the bed except John mm -hmm. McNeil? The tooth fairy? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he would put an explosive on incendiary device there. No. Not on this planet. Right. But he, he could be conned. When John McNeil returned to the house, Alan noticed a change in his behaviour. I know he was looking. He was in there. He was came in the room when we were trying to clear the room and see what was there. He gathered up all the papers and documents from the bureau and put them in boxes and put them in safe. He did that. Mm -hmm. He was doing that sort of thing. But he was in a he was like he was in a hell of a state. Okay. And he he said something about it. But, uh, Really, you ought to go to the, to the authorities and name John McNeil, I would have thought, Barham. I mean, is that...? Well, I, I don't know. I haven't rushed into that for all sorts of reasons. One of the reasons is I'm still in a, a medical treatment mm -hmm. because I, I must emphasise this again. I only had 25% chance of survival at all mm -hmm. and only 25% chance of coming out mentally correct. Mm -hmm. In other words, I may come out a cabbage or compromised or in some way Mm -hmm. Damaged, mentally damaged, which um, which is, can't be determined at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I have been stolen um, to an extent mm -hmm. on, um, on, on, on making a big song and dance to the police or the authorities about this. Some comments made by John McNeil to Alan Wilson suggest that McNeil may not be the only person involved. He, he said to me, uh, 
I don't see why I'm, they, they're making me out and I'm getting all the blame. Not that I'm getting blame. I'm getting all the blame. I said, you're getting all the blame. Alan Wilson spoke to one of the neighbours who I mentioned earlier. I, uh, all I got was from another person around here who he goes uh, out to see about films on TV and they, they record films, that right? All I got was two stories. One was that he had asked him, uh, I, I'm not remembering this very well, uh, if a tape recorder was put somewhere, could it be turned on and off remotely? <coughs> and if a tape recorder was sort of in somebody's room and it was remote, could you then listen to it elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't believe that to be true because young John watches a lot of films and he will know bloody well that about, he's a film addict, mm -hmm. about people recording and listening and mm -hmm. devices. It's in every bloody modern mm -hmm. detective film, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I found that odd. And, so you uh, found that out, what, and then you challenged odd. him on I found it, it odd. And then there was a third statement. Uh, this guy changed the statement again. That he said, oh, John had come into his flat, and he'd been looking at the computer, and he said, oh, what's that on your computer screen? And he said, oh, they're recording devices. No, I think this guy's got something to do with it. And get, I'm getting three different stories off Mr. <laughs> what he says, John said. I was saying three times, different statements. He landed recording devices, and John uh, linked with John McNeil. Right. So Alan thinks his neighbour may have something to do with the fire. Barham suggests the other neighbour, also from London, could be the main instigator due to previous intimidation attempts. It's a possibility then that and conspired in some way to persuade McNeil to put something under Barham Blackett's bed, which caused the fire. Mm -hmm. Since he moved in in 2008, there's been nothing but trouble. As I was um, approached by down in Newcastle Central Station before this atrocity, a few weeks before this atrocity, and he came up waffling to me about, um, I'm a Jew and um, my such and such, I think it was his <laughs> woman, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, what, what the hell is this imbecile talking about? Mm -hmm. He's basically saying we're anti-Semite, which is one with many disinformations being spread. Mm -hmm. In truth, Alan's best friend is a Jew. His lifelong friend was uh, Benny Jacobs, who was the only man who helped him in, when he hit hard times in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. My favourite GP is a Jew. Mm -hmm. you so he's Howard. accusing you of being anti-Semitic? It's absolute, absolute rubbish. A professional would check up on the facts first. Mm -hmm. So you think that, uh, it, that this attempt at you may be, well, it, you, you think it's possibly related to your historical research and the fact that, you know, Alan has had meetings with um, people of the Welsh Assembly or was arranging that and you're possibly going to get some interest in your Ark of the Covenant work. So, but, but, so what you're saying is that let's, let's just go down the route of assumption that this person is a low-grade MI5 spook and that he's been set up to intimidate you or what have you. He, he's actually been given different reasons well, to he intimidate has, you, that you're anti-Semitic, um, so he's been not... Wound up like the proverbial clockwork rat, literally. Right. If I would have taken a, sh a shop sent from London to cause disruption, in here, which he has done since 2008. Got, yeah, and he is from London. He's, He's not from, from London. From up here. He's got no reason to come here. And my inquiries, just, I must remind you that we did have an MI5 operative who I became friends with. And actually, I was actually invited to go for meetings and um, interviews and that about this MI5, MI6 business. I thought I would be uh, proficient in that capacity, but at the time I was doing quite well, I was doing okay. This is a while back. This is going back to the late 90s. Mm -hmm. I was doing okay, so I declined the offer. Maybe I should have taken the offer on board, I don't know. So assuming the fire was deliberate, who is ultimately behind it? And if it was a government, we wouldn't survive. If it was a real government, we could, they could pop us off any time. Mm -hmm. It's what you call the um, rogue element of MI5, basically the under right. Benny I mean, scum. The thing is, Barham, you're actually don't know that fully. You just suspect that. So let's let's just stick to the to what happened. It sounds to me like he's trying to <coughs> um, vindicate or get the blame off himself. You know that he's trying to. Yeah. By he's obviously been worried uh, that the fire has occurred when he's after he's put this thing under your bed. Therefore, he's tr he's trying to get blame off himself, and. It sounds to me that he may well be blameless, that he's maybe being duped into putting this thing there. 
I think McNeil is sort of trying to redeem himself by saying, well, I was only listening to your vice, because he knew that people were telling us about it. Right. Anyway, including <laughs> and others. And he also said to a man, Chris, who works over in a little supermarket opposite, that, look, I'm not going to take all the blame for this. Mm -hmm. He's actually said that. I'm not going to take all the blame for this. Inferring that I'm only a small part of this conspiracy. Right. All the evidence and interviews I have gathered in making this programme will be handed to the police on the day this show is aired. What might the motives be for what seems to be a deliberate attack? Corporate interest has been linked. Corporate interests, particularly more recently, with Pat Allen Hustle up there with his poor star machine. He's ill now. He's, 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 he's about this seventy years old. This is the alleged discovery yeah. of the Ark of the Covenant and other very valuable sites. His poor star machine. He's only one in the UK who has a poor star machine. He's an yep. expert at that. He's in London. He's one of the, our yep. co London, London contacts. To him. He is um, of the opinion, and many others, it's corporate interests. If me and Alan are rubbed out, uh -huh. get me first. And then Alan's a piece of cake. I've been yeah, told that. Because the you are effectively is, protecting they Alan. They could then go and excavate, dig up these vast sites of non ferrous metals. Okay. So could that be, could, be could be one be, huge yeah, motivation. Huge motivation. You think to, to get rid of you and Alan. These you, could be almost parallel with the South African gold mine in a different, oh, intrinsic way. Doubt. Intrinsic way. Now, if we, Alan, are, me and Alan are around, God knows what we'll see. Yeah. We want to get us pushed under the carpet so they could perceive. I mean, for a start, you, you, would, you would become owner, fifty percent owners exactly. of the find. We become by law, and you would be, you, you know, you would be hailed as probably two of the greatest historical researchers, you know, that there are. If that thing is there and if it is dug up, so yeah, I can see a motive perhaps it's, to get you out the picture so that someone else can then come and dig it up. This is just one of dozens of criminal acts against Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett, which I will outline in next week's show. I asked Alan about possible political interests, which may have had an effect in the past. Julian Hodge set up a Bank of Wales. He's a man who started off as an accountant with the British Railways, and he, he had certainly a murky, a semi, seemingly murky start in life. Uh, he was well into the business of people buying cars on higher purchase and before you knew it he had large garages and all that fire purchase and he became a rich and wealthy man and he set up the Bank of Wales. He recruited as directors James Callaghan from MP for Cardiff South who successively was Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary, Chancellor and Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. He also recruited MP for Cardiff West George Thomas, Secretary of State for Wales and Speaker of the House of Commons. They were his directors with him on the Bank of Wales. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, a strange reputation. They moved the Bank of Wales to Jersey, and the story is that South Africa, when as Britain was worried about currency going out of Britain, they weren't worried about it coming in. And South African companies were pumping money into the bank in Jersey, and they was bringing it in then to Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, Virgin Territory, the firm found new companies in the Virgin Territory, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things that Callaghan and Hodge and Thomas did was to buy up open cast coal mining companies and set them up. Now here you've got the miners fighting for their existence under Thatcher. She's going to close them all down. 54 pits in deep pits in Wales, yeah. one of whom was in North Wales, right? The most of them were profitable, mm -hmm. right? And they're uh, supposed to be supporting the miners and at the same time, they're setting up a crouch for mining, Ryan open gas coal mining, another open cast coal mining mining. They're only these. <laughs> they're all set to do open cast instead of deep. But a plan did come into the Western Mail one day, it got printed by mistake, I would think, mm -hmm. of an open cast coal pit 25 miles long, successively, mm -hmm. and a mile wide and 300 metres deep because that's the only way to get the 7,000 million ton of coal out of the Rondon Drift. You can't do it that way. So you way. think some of these big companies, open-cast coal companies... Well, Callaghan and Thomas were into them. Right. Now, they then recruited Nicholas Edwards, who in the Thatcher government was Secretary of State for Wales, mm -hmm. as a director. Right. And Nicholas Edwards decided it would be a good idea if uh, they put £500 million to revitalise the valleys, mm 
-huh. spearheaded by Orion International Open Cast Call, right. of which he was a director. Right. Now, Nicholas Head was his Secretary of State of Wales, an MP, and he's a director of this company. And as Secretary of State, he's going to give a company that he's an executive director of right. 500 million quid. Right. So we wrote to Thatcher. I did. And I said, look so at this you guy. Wrote, you wrote to Margaret Thatcher? I did. So I got a reply from a flunky. So I wrote back and I said, Mr. Thatcher, I didn't, I didn't write to you, flunky. I wrote to you. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about it? I got a reply from a different flunky. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a third time. I said, look, I'm writing you for the third time about this guy Edwards, you know. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about it? And Nicholas Edwards resigned. Bang. So now, he resigned then? Aye. Now, the other thing is, Callaghan and Thomas and Hodge bought land at Lantricent. Useless land, not up to much. No good. Mm -hmm. When they then, Labour Party, wanted to move the Royal Mint out of London, because it couldn't expand because of the confined area in London it had, the only place to put it in Britain was right on the land owned by Callaghan, Thomas and Hodge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Late one Thursday night, about 20-odd Labour MPs kept a meaningless debate going and going and going about two in the morning. Mm -hmm. And in walked Thomas and Callaghan, mm -hmm. and they apologised to the House of Commons. By apologising to the House of Commons, and the apology was accepted, it means that matter can never, ever be discussed again. So what were they apologising for, Alan? Well, they're crooks. They own the land at Lantricent, and they made a fortune by putting the Royal Mint on it. Right. Okay. They're, so they're, they're going to be looking through bars, all right? They're not so going to be drinking at the bar. They're okay, going to be looking so through this, them. So you, what you're saying is that there's, that there's corruption involved all in, over the in, place, in politics. How's, how's that affected your work then? Are you saying that some of these big businesses would, well, they not, don't want would us not want archaeological digs in On Wales sites that are valuable for that other purposes. Coal underneath them. That's right. That's part of it. Right. So there's so all there's sorts. Another, you you wouldn't be putting the windmill farm up on that damn mountain if if, if they know what we got there. So, th so there's a possible another motive of the, um, the powers that be, should we say, to not want you that's right. uh, just making discoveries or, or that's right. archaeological digs because there's right. coal under there. But, but they're not digging it out now. It's a fu future resource, but you'll never right. get it up if King right. Arthur and uh, all the other things that's on it are on it. Right. So you'll never touch it. So, so they don't know where we're right. going to find something next, do they? Yeah. So if, if say the Ark of the Covenant was dug up at Unasable, then there's no way people are going to start digging coal from there. That's what you're saying. Well, if, if it's going to be, would if, turn, if the, would it, Arthur, be and, into Arthur and St Peter's and King High Karanak and the grave of King Moilig is all up on the mountain above Brunner, you're not going to get that on the drift. Mm -hmm. You ain't going to dig that up. Right. Okay. So there's another. Now, you possible wouldn't mode. dig up coal in Stonehenge, would you? You did destroy Stonehenge? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. You can see when we get that. Yeah, yeah. And th these are, we've had to find out what reasons there might be in this. Thing. But there's other yeah. little things, uh, you know, also little things in the straws in the wind. Well, one of the things that you want done is to have the site excavated on Unisabal to see if the Ark of the Covenant is there, one of the most I mean, important well, something's there. artifacts. Uh, because the metal, yeah. the metal, see, a metal yeah. detector... It's not human being. It can't lie. Mm -hmm. It goes bzz, 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 bzz. Yeah. and if it hits non-ferrous metal, it goes ding, ding, ding. Yeah. If it's ferrous metal, it's dong, dong, dong. Yeah. Well, it's, the bottom line is we're asking them to dig a hole, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. cork all the flim flam out, subterfuge in the these slimy cloak and dagger mm -hmm. um, conspiracies and this conniving. Mm -hmm. If we are incorrect. Only one, we will have egg on our faces. Mm -hmm. But they have been avoiding digging that place up at all costs. Mm -hmm. The evidence as to why the Ark of the Covenant is claimed to be in this location will be presented in a future show. I spoke to the metal detection expert who has already surveyed the site. And I've spoken to Alan Hassel and I've, had a, I've got a full statement Good of life. Alan, so I, I, I independently... You know, he's a trustworthy guy. Well, Pete was, someone was there, and we went to see the farmers, yeah. and we said, please, come 300 yards up to the... Yeah. Get on your car, and we can drive a Land Rover. Oh, we'll come up some other time. Mm -hmm. As if we're going to go 300 yeah. miles, don't they? You know, 350 miles. OK, Alan, let's just say the site is excavated on Unisabal, and the Ark of the Covenant is proven to be there. Yeah. Then, basically, you will be vindicated 100%, and, and your work, your other work... Yeah. People will then have to take everything 
you know, that, that would be the well, catalyst we, which we will know. get your work. The, the most obvious thing. Accepted. I've just finished negotiating with the two farmers, two brothers who own the land behind me here at Unus Abul. And on their land there is um, a man-made mound in which Alan Wilson believes the Ark of the Covenant is buried. Now, it was quite a delicate negotiation. Um, I asked if I could go on the land to take some photographs and they, straight away they said no. So then they wanted to know why, so I explained the fact that I'd followed some of Alan Wilson's work and they were obviously they were very well aware of Alan's work and they explained to me what happened when he came here and that he brought some ground penetrating radar here and he did some tests etc. Now they said that um, they weren't convinced that he'd actually found anything and they said that, that, that he hadn't actually shown them any, any concrete results, there was, that there was anything there. So therefore they weren't prepared to have their land dug up based on what they thought was nothing. Um, but they then did say that, that, having said that, they didn't go up there and see what he was doing, they didn't show much interest. Um, so I've persuaded them to um, at least get, have an independent person come on the land and do another test and if they do find something there and they can demonstrate it to them that they would possibly then consider uh, having the land excavated to see if there is indeed anything there and in and, and, and the very if that's what it is it, if it is a conspiracy and there was this incendiary device they very nearly succeeded uh, in the summer of 2011 uh, Barham so you know um, it's really it's you know, absolutely uh, heinous, um, uh, heinous criminal deed. I, I will mention that um, we looked at Mac McNeil was very well given hospitality, free accommodation for three years. Whether he thought it was a incendiary device or a listening device or a banana skin, he had no business going into my bedroom mm -hmm. and planting it under the bed. Yeah, yeah. He was true. It was treachery. Yeah. At best, he's an imbecile who's treacherous. That's yeah. the best scenario, I think, you know, okay. that's the best. Now, the imbecility factor, human imbecility factor, is what these MI5 rely on most weaknesses. You know, I don't claim to, 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 dupe, to dupe people into doing X, Y, and Z. So they give them a, give them a false motive. Uh, yeah, a false motive and a combination of other things, including monies, yeah. by the way, and look, get looked after. They get, get the poor strings, they get them accommodation and all sorts of skullduggery goes on. The point is, um, I'm, I can't be bluffed by them. Mm -hmm. I can't be fooled by them. I can't be manipulated by them. So it doesn't matter about the ark. You, you get the cross first if you want. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll get King Arthur if you want. Yeah. And we found the treasure site. Yeah. Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And they, the British, gathered together all the treasures of Britain and buried them in one place. And no man has seen them since. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I'm very loyal. Which is becoming an unfashionable quality these, in this generation, likely in old, old school, uh, old school values. I've been down to the site where y you and Alan, um, well, Alan says he knows the Ark of the Covenant is buried at Unassable. The other thing that I discussed with them, I asked them if they knew about the significance of the Ark of the Covenant, and I don't think they understood the full significance of it. But I, I did discuss with them the. the you know, the fact that this could bring hundreds, well, tens of thousands of jobs to South Wales. It will become almost like a, a new mecca. It, it's not just a, a treasure, you know, coins or something like that. It's something of global significance. And when I said that to him, he did kind of, he obviously has been told that by Alan, but I don't think he fully believed it. I don't think they've, I don't think they've really fully understood the magnitude of what could be in this hill, if Alan Wilson is correct. Uh, so at least I've persuaded them to have a second opinion um, of someone who can do some metal detection and so I'm now going to try and seek that out and get back to them and see if we can come back here and do some tests on this hill. Alright now, well thanks very much for your time and um, You're welcome. hopefully this interview is going to do some good and you know let's just hope we can get some excavation done on any one of these sites. Uh, my my wish, uh, I'm old guy, it's 59, you know, we do wish, uh, we've seen these valleys, we've seen a state that there's 30,000 jobs here for people yeah, who are destitute. Mm -hmm. And they, that that is really one hell of a thing that needs to yeah. be done. All right, thanks, Alan.